So many people are looking to live happier, more stress-free lives. We provide interviews from mental health experts across various fields because we know finding quality information isn't always easy. Let's find more sanity together. On today's episode, Jared Cohen talks about the field of sport and performance psychology. Jared has a master's degree in sport and performance psychology and an MBA with a focus on organizational psychology, and currently works as a mental performance coach. He specializes in equipping clients with psychological based models and related skills to improve their ability to use their previous experiences and accelerate their growing expertise to increase their desired performance. In this work, he helps instill a lifelong learner's mindset about themselves, relationships, and their pursuits, so they are more capable of living interesting, fulfilling, and meaningful lives. Moreover, he delivers customized leadership and human dynamics training for executive teams to help them examine how they operate and provide them with frameworks for evolving their mindset and behaviors. Jared has worked with athletes, fitness enthusiasts, business owners and executives, and government employees. He recently worked as a cognitive enhancement coach for the TSA to help them improve their working memory, reaction time speed, accuracy, heart rate variability, vigilance, and well-being. He currently works as a director of human performance and leadership development at an insurance company. He has worked for years as a fitness coach in varying capacities. Now on to the interview. Jared, welcome on the show. Jason, it is an honor. A uh, little uh, tidbit for your fans is that uh, when I was first starting my podcast, you were the person I wanted for my original co-host. So I'm glad we're finally here doing this. We're, we're finally going ahead and doing it. Um, before I was still in um, uh, internship, uh, I don't think you started in your master's program yet, but Jared was actually one of my uh, CrossFit coaches, my main CrossFit coach. Um, and you have gone on to I've get on. Uh, a degree in, uh, w- what's the name of the degree? Uh, so I have my master's in sport and performance psychology, as well as an MBA, uh, with a focus in organizational psychology. Okay. And, um, so you have the master's, you have the MBA, um, your profession, what do you call your profession? What do you do? Uh, so the way I refer to it, um, if I'm just sort of doing stuff, um, on my own, um, is mental performance coaching, right? So I don't have my doctorate and I don't have a licensure, so I can't use the term psychologist because that's protected. Right. Um, and I'm not in a clinical setting or doing any kind of diagnosing. So wouldn't call myself a therapist. Uh, it's more within the coach context, coaching. Okay. And what type of performance do you actually help people or coach people on? So I think the easiest way to frame this is uh, what I believe has been popularized, um, maybe even originated by Michael Gervais, who uh, is a sport and performance psychologist. Um, And he talks about it in terms of the fact that in life, there's really only three things you can train in the entirety, right? We can just have these three buckets. So there's the physical, which would include nutrition, sleep, exercise, that physical domain. There's the technical or craft specific domain. So this for you right now could be the technical expertise of podcasting. Sometimes it's the technical expertise of being a um, psychologist. Sometimes it's the technical expertise of being a son, right? Whatever that like specific context is that has its own kind of vocabulary, rules, standards, measurements, et cetera. And then there's this third piece, which everyone knows about and it's always involved, but we don't really systematically train it. And that's this mental component. So oftentimes we hear people say like, God, that workout was really mental or um, you know, like, how was that speech you gave? 
Uh, it just, it, you know, the material is fine, but I just like wasn't in it. I, I didn't really feel it. Right. What are we talking about? We're talking about how your mind either gives you access to the sort of full capabilities of your skill set or it hinders it in some way. So mental training, mental performance training is helping people to tap into that. Um, the definition I like to use is the study and application the psychological principles of human performance in order to help people consistently perform in the upper ranges of their capability and more thoroughly enjoy the process. So you talked about sports, uh, but it's not just about sports. It's also about more of like this, this industrial organizational world to increasing performance while uh, at companies or where people are working or different type things. So I'm hoping you give an example for, for both. And so if you could give some like, you know, basic, like what would you do with someone that's an athlete or someone in the sports world? And then also what might this look like in the actual industry organizational world? Yeah. So another way we can define this more clearly is like, what is performance? Um, one way to think about it is performance is usually something that has like standards, measurements, and probably some amount of consequences. Sometimes, sometimes not. The other way to think about it is just like, it's anything you care about, right? Um, my performance with my family the other night at dinner, like didn't go so well. Now we might not say performance, but ultimately, right, there's some consequence that you are invested in and therefore you're interested in how you did or how you're doing. So go back to your question more specifically. Um, in sport, um, let's take the sport of basketball, right? Um, how do you help a player perform in the upper ranges of their capability most of the time, more consistently. Um, and what does that involve? Oftentimes it involves kind of three main things. It'll involve, you know, what is their experience? What is their mental experience like before they go play? What is it like while they're playing and what's it playing either? What's it like after they're done playing or maybe even in these like intermediary moments where they're not playing, right? They're sitting on the bench and they've, just had some outcome that that was maybe great or it wasn't either way what's going on with their mind and how are they most aware and managing that to continue their performance in this moment in time or over the long term uh, in an organizational context uh, this could involve a lot of things um, oftentimes i think some of the bigger buckets that we're talking about or coaching people on has to do with uh, leadership and team dynamics. Um, how do you enroll people in a vision? How do you engage with people in different ways to help that dynamic be as successful as possible? How do you create psychological safety? How do you stay committed when you're under pressure or distress? Um, how do you overcome setbacks? So again, common things in many different contexts of life. Um, I think in the world of organizations and business, um, you know, this gets a lot of attention because oftentimes we're thinking about things in terms of, you know, what is that final outcome um, and how does that affect the bottom line? So is this more of a group practice or an individual practice? Meaning like, you know, for if you're doing sports, is it the whole team? If you're doing a department, is it the whole department or is this like a one on one activity or maybe it's both? Yeah, it can totally be both. Um, it's um, it's, you know, that's where I think the context of coaching is helpful, right? You can coach a group of people. You can coach uh, one on one. Um, sometimes when it's done in more of like an educational setting at times, it's usually in a more of a group fashion. Um, and then other times there's sort of a particular need to really individualize the skills. Um, so there's always that back and forth. It just kind of defend, depends on like, what's the outcome that this group of people seeks? What's the outcome that this person seeks? Um, sometimes the group dynamic is really helpful because, you know, like in any class setting, there's that shared experience there's like the kind of mind meld where people get to hear other people's experiences um and if it's like really a team right like this is a basketball team or this is a leadership team then it is really important that 
you know, there's a coach there of my sort that is facilitating the like evolution of this group dynamics. And then, of course, you know, people have their own specific things that they need help fine tuning. And that's where more of that personal one on one approach would come in. So you mentioned um, three different things that are trained, the technical expertise, physical um, and mental for you. Are you focusing on all three of these or is it just one or two of these categories? How does that work? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, in my past. Uh, well, it, it really it depends on the context I'm in. Um, because I have a background in like fitness and movement, um, I find that sometimes like I, I can kind of dabble in the physical and the mental, right? Like I, I have enough expertise to sort of speak about nutrition, speak about sleep, speak about like movement hygiene that oftentimes really does nicely overlay with the kind of mental stuff we're talking about, especially when we get into like um, the topics of, of breath practice and how that can influence someone's energy upregulating and downregulating. Uh, usually the technical side um, I'm not, advising it at all right that would be what's more thought of with the title of like a consultant um and the the technical side and i think this is very common in a lot of types of uh, like therapeutic models as well is that like we as the coach or therapist there we want to allow our clients or patients to be like the subject matter expert on themselves and also their discipline. Right. And that like helps with that coach client relationship, um, you know, is for them to feel empowered about like how they can also teach us and provide us with the context for what their reality is like so that we can better. Suggest interventions or just ask the right questions for how that they they can improve that experience. Uh, so outside of you, say that someone doesn't have a coaching background, is this are, are people with this type of degree and doing this type of practice working mostly in the mental space? Um, with this type of degree? Yeah, like people that are doing like performance psychology. Yeah, I would say so. Um, I think there are, you know, people that maybe um, are like already kind of coaching in some physical capacity um and you know then they're sort of adding this degree to sort of the well-roundedness of their mental models of how to help people grow and develop uh but yeah i think the 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 bulk of this is meant to be you know how to help people grow their self-awareness self-regulation and self-reflection skills okay since since you mentioned those three concepts um in, in your practice or in your field, what's the importance of those? Yeah. So, um, I think the first thing to say is that I think in some ways we're all familiar with these ideas. I'm going to define them like in the way that I define them in a second here, but just to, to say that what I think is important about this again is like putting a label to these things um, oftentimes I hear people describe their approaches, even in the world of sport performance. And it sounds very piecemeal. Um, it's like, okay, you could do this, you could do that. And then here's another like skill you could teach someone, but without the context, it's really hard to sort of understand what these things are in service of. So I refer to self-awareness, self-regulation and self-reflection as the foundational mental skills. And then any other skill we talk about can be kind of filtered through those three. So let's take each one. So self-awareness I define as taking inventory of how you're likely to behave in a given situation and the thoughts and feelings that influence that behavior. So a couple important things about that definition. One is that it's active, right? So I used it taking inventory. Like it should be a, it should be thought of as a verb, right? That self-awareness is not a passive activity, but we want to help people actually train it in such a way that they get much better at how they can sort of grow that inventory of, of understanding of the kind of cause and effect um, of their experience. Um, 
behavior is like, as you know, a nice starting place for a lot of people because it's most observable. And then we can kind of work backwards from there to kind of consider, hey, what were the thoughts and feelings that led to that? And then the other piece that I mentioned was given situation. I think this is so important. And that's this idea of mental flexibility, um, which then leads into self-regulation. So self-regulation is the ability to adapt your behaviors given the situation, the intended outcome, and the interplay between the two. So a formula that I like to use for people to uh, sort of visualize this is situation times behavior equals result. And so it now just sort of gives us a sense of like, what are these different pieces? You know, what is this situation I'm in both externally, like right now we're podcasting and then also what's like my internal situation? What's the intended outcome I want to have from this experience? And then how how can I actually be more flexible with my behavior and ultimately even my thoughts and feelings, right? That I'm not overly attaching to them so that I can be more in service of this ideal outcome and not overly swayed by the um, competing sense data that is often, you know, the, the randomness of, of just incoming thoughts and emotion. And then finally, self-reflection uh, is like the meaning making process. Um, so how do you make sense? How do you um, assess and evaluate the experience you just have, you just had to then sort of integrate it in a conscious way that then sort of informs your experience going forward? It's interesting when you say all that, because I'm thinking of how much that goes on in, in therapy and different thera therapeutic theories. And what I'm realizing as I keep learning and growing is how much um, overlap there is in different theories and people have different, different terms for different things. And, you know, not, not all theories completely overlap, uh, but there are some core things among many theories <laughs> that, that sound very similar to this. Yeah, hundred percent. And this is like my biggest, I think, pet peeve. And um, it, I, I just, I, I think we overcomplicate things, you know, and we, um, we use a lot of different terms to mean the same thing. This is actually a, um, like a studied thing in psychology. It's called the jingle jangle theory. Have you heard of this? I have not. Um, I'm going to kind of butcher it, but it's like That's when, good. you know, the, a different word, different words mean the same thing. And then like the, the vice versa of that, um, when the same words actually mean different things. Right. And it, it's just it, there's so much confusion. Um, and that's why I like these terms, because they're not fancy necessarily, um, but they're really specific. And then therefore, like, I feel like if we all just could kind of speak in these just general terms, then everything could get a lot like clearer and more streamlined. Um, so when you are working with people to try and increase self-awareness, self-regulation. Um, how, what does that actually look like? How are you getting people from, from A to B and the third one, self-reflection? How, how do you get uh, someone to do there? What are you doing? Like, what is your intervention? I guess that would be the term that I would use. Yeah. So um, personally, um, I'm a big fan of mental models and frameworks. Um, some of which come more from the world of personality psychology, because I think frameworks give people a really concrete and tangible way to start kind of structuring the reflection that then becomes the sort of improved awareness of their experiences. And if it's a good framework, you then that framework can also be used to self-regulate. So let me give you an example. Um, one example is Carol Dweck's growth versus a fixed mindset concept. Um, and so just to unpack some of these terms, a mindset, this is also another one of these things, like gets thrown around, thrown around a lot, right? And you have now like people out in the world that say they're the mindset coach, right? So what's mindset? Mindset is just a set of beliefs that drive behavior. So what Carol Dweck is talking about is 
when she's in her model, she's what she's looking at is a specific mindset of how of what you believe to be true about your talent, knowledge and abilities. So a growth mindset believes that they can infinitely develop their talent, knowledge and abilities. And they also believe in th that to be true amongst others as well. A fixed mindset believes that their talent, knowledge and, and abilities ultimately have some cap. There's this limitation. And then we can break that down further in terms of some different categories of life context. So what mindset do you have when you're dealing with challenges? What mindset do you have when dealing with setbacks? What mindset do you have when having to exert effort? What mindset do you have when you are being given feedback. And so now, right, you've given someone a framing to consider their thoughts, their feelings and their behavior. Um, I often say feedback is like my favorite example, because most people will say, oh, yeah, give me feedback, you know, and that's very like growth minded of them. But then someone will often give them feedback that they don't like mm -hmm. and their behavior will not appear very growth oriented, right? It'll be defensive um, and it won't be very sort of accepting and like integrating of that information. Um, and so once you can kind of be aware of where these sort of like belief, starting beliefs and then like in the moment behaviors actually detract, now you can start self-regulating. Or if you miss that opportunity to better self-regulate, you can reflect on what happened to improve kind of your strategy for better serving that intended outcome, that future vision going forward. All right. So I might be making a wrong interpretation, but it sounds like it's like growth through psychoeducation. You help people understand the theories, how the human mind works. And with that education, they could better understand what they're doing, which allows them to change what they're doing. Yeah, totally. I, and I, I think that's that's pretty spot on. Um, that's definitely like my main philosophy of, of practice. Like it's all sort of being driven by kind of a learning and development orientation. Um, you know, how do you help people learn more about themselves, others and their pursuits so that they have the, the flexibility to to grow and adapt based on what's like important to them? Um, and so that's where, you know, you, you asked like, well, what are some other ways you can train this? Um, well, you know, motivation is probably one of the, like the biggest, um, levers of sport and performance psychology and within motivation is helping to educate people like what is motivation and what are some of the theories that give people a working sense of how they're motivated and how their motivation affects them so that then they can kind of have more control over that. And within a self-awareness piece is like, what awareness do you have around like why you do what you do? And I think in sport, in business, um, you'd be surprised, even people that are really great at what they do, if you ask them like, you know, why? They're kind of dumbfounded and they've never really taken the time to think about it. And even if they have, they've yet to come to a really clear articulated answer and when that is not clearly articulated you can just predict how much more that'll then break down and not support them in times of extreme pressure and distress uh so so before you, you were talking about technical expertise physical mental um and it, it sounds like you guys work more more so in the physical and mental unless you do have the technical expertise that the person has like if someone is an athlete and you know how to coach and of course you could do that but right if you're working on a field like aerospace engineering um you and i probably would have no clue how to help with technical expertise mental is a big uh piece there um what what are what does the mental training look like like what what in your mind what does that break down into yeah so uh i recently worked with the tsa uh the transportation security agency Mm -hmm. I think we're all um, very familiar and, with the TSA. Um, what <laughs> I, I said, I think we're all all very familiar with the TSA at this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah I would hope in a good so. way. I just I not in a bad to, way. You know, in a good way. You're yeah. international fans, maybe. Sure. Um, so, you know, the TSA is really interesting, and that was a great experience to 
also test my own learning capabilities, right? Like how fast could I go into an environment um, that I know nothing about really other than my own experience and quickly learn their reality, right? Like their, their culture, their, their shorthand, right? Acronyms for everything. Um, and also their struggles, their sort of history, right? TSA didn't exist before 9-11. So we're also talking about a young organization. Um, and so then within that is to sort of say, okay, well, what, what can my work do? Um, and why would my work, this type of work, be of use? So here is literally how I explained it to the TSA, right? And I would start, and this is another example, I think of like, this is actually interesting because what I'm going to share with you I think it is an example where like the technical and the mental do start to fold in and um, and how sometimes I think the people that are really in their technical thing are so in it that they can't really understand it or maybe speak as succinctly about it as I would. And so I can kind of help them achieve a new perspective. Right. Which, again, is like entirely at the heart of like the cognitive model. So I would start with the TSA and I'd say, OK, um, what is it that you guys do? Like, how would you describe this to somebody that doesn't know? And um, you get a variety of answers. Um, you know, some people say like uh, security, um, bomb detector, <laughs> you know. Um, but again, I'm really trying to get them to think like very specifically. So the answer is they're threat detectors, right? Threat detectors in order to keep people safe. And then to go down from there, like asking, OK, like, well, how do you do that? Obviously, you have a lot of like specific roles and responsibilities, but like if there was just one word to describe what it is that it sort of encompasses everything, the word is vigilance. And so then I come in and say, OK, well, why are we having this training? Well, the reason we're having this training is to help you accelerate your expertise in being vigilant to improve your performance as threat detectors. Right. And so. Now, then you can kind of break down like, okay, well, what does vigilance entail? Well, vigilance entails energy, thoughts, and attention. So we would say that vigilance is the ability to um, concentrate precisely for a sustained period of time on a single or a handful of tasks. Um, and so if you even break that definition down, ability refers to confidence and thoughts. Concentration and attention obviously refers to like the whole realm of what control people have over their attentional resources. And then sustaining this over a long period of time, especially when it's very monotonous, has to do with how somebody is aware and then can better regulate their energy. And, and you, you had also mentioned that the that the military is, is hiring uh, performance psychologist. I think you had mentioned the Air Force, maybe the Army too. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. What, what are they? What is the military using uh, using this for? So the Army has has used it for a, a while. Um, a lot of it comes from the work of uh, Martin Seligman and and the positive psychology world, uh, which performance psych draws a lot from. Um, and so one of the things that they're doing there is they're they're looking at it more from a lens of like resilience. Um, you know, how to help soldiers um, more rapidly recover from hardship. Right. And, and we can kind of think about all the different ways in which that might look deployment, you know, transition time away from family. Um, but it comes back to a lot of the same principles. Right. What are you motivated by? Um, what are your values? How can you more clearly define and articulate those so that you can sort of use those as guideposts. Um, you know, with the Air Force, this might look like um, just dealing with the kind of pressure of um, getting through the different levels of their training academies so that they can get their sort of choice of aircraft, right? And so like any kind of competitive scenario, how do you work through the length of time in which you have to show up and your performance has consequences associated with it? Um, and there's a lot kind of competing for your attention. Um, so again, 
how do you manage that attention more effectively? What is your awareness over that attention so that you can then regulate it and not let the distractions block your ability to sort of access your training? So again, I think there's this principle of you've put in the work, right? Nobody's saying that mental performance can be a substitute for like actually practicing the technical expertise. But then most people feel like, you know, I've done it in practice, like I'm, I'm amazing. But then they go on the main stage and they can't access it. Right. And there's all sorts of the kind of performance anxiety uh, or even just obstacles for how someone, again, can be more adaptable. Um, and so that performance psychology work is going to look at how to help somebody unlock that level of adaptability. OK. And do you. um do you guys do like cognitive training too? Like what you, cause you're talking a lot about like attention and it sounds like you're talking a bit of interweaved here without saying the word like working memory and things like that. Like, do you guys do things to try and fortify actual ability or is it all perceptual flexibility balance? Um, yeah, that's a good question. It, it can be a little bit of both. Um, now you you'll like see in the job market there's the the term is more like cognitive enhancement coach or cognitive performance coach and so definitely like for the tsa um you know some of the metrics we were looking at to see if our psychoeducation was working were actual like cognitive metrics like working memory decision making speed um visual uh spatial processing um spatial orientation so sometimes some work will involve some of that um i would say it's it's less so um it's definitely not part of my main expertise right i you know i i know a little bit about like you know memory palaces and and those types of things but it's really more about the sort of perceptual piece and how someone can best improve those awareness regulation and reflection skills so that they have the access to a better working memory, better decision making speed, et cetera. Okay. So you're getting the gunk out of the plumbing. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you mentioned um you, you mentioned some theories. Uh um and, and I want to go through some other ones so people get a sense of like what this work is anchored in because I think it's I think it's a great thing to go through because it shows um you guys that, that your field is pulling from multiple different psychological theories, yeah. valid theories, um, and and some of them even clinical theories and or theories that clinical work is based off of, right. and you're using them in a different light to have somewhat of a different different outcome. Uh, but when you had talked about mental training, when we had talked earlier, you talked about like confidence, willingness versus ability. So I was hoping that you could dive that into that a little bit more, and then we'll go into some specific theories. Yeah. Uh, so oftentimes I think about this sort of growth hierarchy and, um, um, what was his name that you had on the show, um, that spoke about willingness? Oh, Michael Tompkins, Michael Tompkins. Yeah. So very similar to what Michael Tompkins spoke about in terms of like the importance of willingness and uh, so I often think about it, though, in terms of like awareness, willingness and ability. And um, and so in this context, like what what is the awareness that somebody has about some of the sort of changes or opportunities for growth that they could benefit from? And then from there, like what is that level of willingness to sort of engage in that process to actually commit to the deliberate practice um, that would be necessary to sort of actually grow those skills and learn those like how to's. So when I think about the difference between willingness and ability, I think of like willingness as like, um, you know, what somebody is willing to do. And then ability is like, what is the how's in there that they're actually then being given um, as ways to start actually cultivating those skills. Um, so deliberate practice, I mentioned, this is comes from the work of Anders Ericsson, um, who most people sort of know indirectly from Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 Hours. He's actually the researcher that has studied, um, you know, expertise uh, over a long period of time 
and really looked at like what does it take for somebody to become expert in their discipline right so we're very interested in the like science of high performance and the type of practice um, that is actually required for these neurological changes to take place uh, where somebody has more mastery um, motivation we t I talked about earlier so the main theory that we anchor in in the world of sport and performance psychology comes from um, uh, I'm forgetting their first names but last names are, are Ryan and Desi I think it's Edward Desi um, self-determination theory OK, so self-determination theory is anchored in the idea that we have these sort of three main psychological needs. And those are autonomy. Competence and connectedness or relatedness. And when those three are sort of more fulfilled or in balance, then you're most likely to have this fully intrinsic motivation. When those are out of balance or not appropriately fulfilled or met, then you're more likely to see uh, what is often referred to as like intrinsic motivation, or I'll sometimes refer to it as like pressurized motivation, right? Because again, there's kind of something at stake, whether it's like reward or punishment, or it's even just the internal pressure of this feeling of like, I need to, I have to, right? How many times has somebody made a New Year's resolution that's like, I have to lose weight? And it just doesn't really work, right? Because it's not really coming from a place of autonomy, right? Um, so there's that lack of willingness. Um, it's also maybe lacking the competency, right? How do I do this? Um, you know, as opposed to just starving myself or counting calories, like there's a lot of good research and even like substitutions now that are tasty that can make somebody that much more successful, and then therefore feel more confident. And this gets into self-efficacy. Um, and then we all know, especially with motivation, if you know the people around us are not practicing in a similar manner um, or sort of involved in that shared experience of the thing that we're deliberately pursuing, um, it can be very hard to maintain that. And they, there can be a big pull or tension. there. Yeah, and I want to give a, a, an example. I think a lot of us can relate to you're trying to eat healthy. Um, you're going out to dinner with close friends that are not going to, they or start ordering all these things and you think I'm going to get the grilled chicken and vegetables. And you're like, uh, okay. And then you order like the chicken parm or something like that. And right. it happens all the time. But I think, you know, many of us know that if all of our friends are on a health kick, it's much easier to get um, in, into that kick. And uh, so I understand what you're saying there. Uh, so self-efficacy theory, is that something that you covered before with uh, when you were talking about like confidence um, and stuff like that? Or is that a, or is there more detail to that theory? Um, there's a little more detail. I would say actually Albert Bandura, who came up with the self-efficacy theory, um, which was, you know, very much sort of this, um, you know, kind of coming from more of like the humanistic um, folks like Maslow and um, Carl Rogers, um, as well as sort of um, pulling from, you know, the cognitive theories, um, Albert Ellis um, and uh, Aaron Beck, you know, was then also wanting to kind of combine more of like the social and the cognitive aspect and was like a real front runner uh, with other people like Walter Michel, uh, who's most known for coming up with the marshmallow study, um, delaying gratification, mm -hmm. you know, again, that gets into willingness to really consider this interplay between like the person and the situation. Um, and this was like, you know, a huge kind of game changer in the like mid 60s for understanding or thinking about how, you know, we don't necessarily have these like fixed traits. Um, you know, there's some genetic components. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Your dog came on the show. Dog came on the show. <laughs> What's your dog's name for the audience? Uh, her name is Taka. Many people think Taka is very um, chill and nonchalant and almost kind of like a meditative dog. But what they don't realize is that in her home environment, she's overly protective. Okay. Um, so, uh, so, so anyway, I got a little off track there. Um, Bandura 
was one of the first people to also talk about like human agency. And in his model, he talks about self-regulation, self-reflection, as well as like this kind of self-awareness piece of like intentionality and forethought, like literally projecting yourself into the future. Um, and, and within that is then the experience of being able to develop more self-efficacy, meaning the belief that you can perform a desired behavior. Um, and so his model um, has sort of uh, like f- kind of four main sources to confidence. So you have like past experience, um, which again can work for or against. Mm-hmm. Um, you have uh, the sort of energetic aspect. So like the somatic experience and how that influences your feelings of confidence or your belief in your abilities this could be as simple as like how confident do you feel after getting like two hours of sleep the night before? Right. And you got to do something, but it can also be as sort of cognitively evolved in terms of like, how do you make sense out of those physical sensations? Right. So instead of uh, inferring that butterflies in your stomach implies that you are not ready and that your anxiety is a sign of inability, you could actually, you know, right. Positively frame that. Um, then there's the modeling aspect, the sort of like um, vicarious nature of confidence in sports psych. We often refer to uh, Roger Bannister, who was like the first person documented to break the four minute mile, which like back in the 50s, they thought was impossible. But then a year later, like 34 more people broke that. Right. So what changed? Just a, a sense of what was possible. Right. Again. So, you know, this also goes with growth mindset. You know, when you see somebody that is accomplishing more than you, do you view that as a threat or do you view that as like representative of your ability to also do the same? Um, And then finally is self-talk. And so this is where sport and performance psychology spends a lot of time. Obviously it comes um, primarily from the, the world of, of cognitive therapy. Um, and I think is now also heavily informed by, by what we understand actually happening with the brain and neuroscience and the power of, of words to literally affect brain uh, networking. Uh, but this is everybody's sort of main tool for having control of their confidence at any time. Right. Oftentimes we're only relying on past experience or we're only relying on what we've seen other people accomplish uh, or how we feel. And we know if we're just waiting to do something based on how we feel, that's never going to work. We want to actually be able to um, act ourselves into feeling. And sometimes we're going to need to literally talk ourselves into that before we can feel ourselves into action. Okay. Yep, I'm, I'm hearing some uh, some some CBT type stuff <laughs> coming through there. Um, you you also previously talked about attribution theory, uh, perception theory. So so what are those guys? Uh, so attribution theory, um, the history of that you have. Um, so Julian Rotter, I believe, was was the first person to um, come up with the theory of locus of control. So internal and external. Um, And uh, this was actually, I think, more in terms of just an overall like view of the world. Right. How often are you to kind of think about what control you have? Um, And then you had um, Bernard Weiner, who added this component uh, that also involved um, stability. Right. So what's the stability or instability of what occurred? and then. Martin Seligman furthered this even more, which I think is what most people are familiar with nowadays and often referred to more as explanatory styles. And this is um, when you're also thinking about the um, the pervasiveness of something. So he often refers to pessimism as being the byproduct of overly explaining things as personal, permanent and pervasive. Um, and this again is a nice mental model. It's easy to remember. And it's one to build self-awareness around, right? The, the literal action of, Hey, when was the last time that I 
made meaning out of something and declared it as being, you know, always about me. Uh, this always has to do with me always meaning it's permanent. And it also extends into other experiences of my life. And when we can increase that awareness or even our reflection of it, then in the moment we can start kind of catching it and, and actually um, challenging those thoughts literally mm-hmm. in the moment. And, and working with depressed patients, uh, I mean, I, I, I call it, and I think other cognitive therapists, he's cognitive behavior therapists call it internal global stable. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. me, it's everywhere, it's everything about me and it's never going to change. Um, and people could like, I'm stupid, you know, things like that, internal global stable. Um, and it's also interesting, like going back to confidence, I think, you know, the, the global, the scope of consequence is how I think about it and how oftentimes, you know, when somebody messes up in one aspect of their life, they're really quick to assume that that means sort of inability in what objectively is like a totally unrelated aspect. Absolutely. Um, and so to really break that down and say like, well, you know, and I think this, oh, here's a great thing. Uh, Paul Grant, right? Dr. Paul Grant. Yeah. Yeah. He was on the show. Um, he was yeah. on the show. Uh, recovery oriented cognitive, uh, cognitive therapy. therapy. And, you know, he said something in there that is like, literally, if you take a sports psych one one class, like this is like one of the first things you'll talk about, which is like literally getting someone to reflect on like, who are you when you're at your best? You know, like, what does it look like? What does it feel like? Um, and so that's a self-reflection moment. Um, and then starting to build more awareness throughout your life of like when those things are happening and distilling those common patterns and themes. And so all these things to kind of combat some of the ways in which we explain things or make meaning of our experiences in ways that are actually more maladaptive than adaptive or uh, debilitative versus uh, facilitative. Carol Dweck has a great example in her book Mindset where she talks about, um, you know, and and like somebody uh, walking over and like spilling uh, a glass of milk. Right. And they quickly attribute it to, oh, my God, I'm so clumsy. Mm -hmm. Right. Versus what if you made no attribution at all? Right. You just like spilled it. And then went and cleaned it up, right? And you actually didn't have to make any meaning about it, right? You didn't have to assign any personal connection or causality. Um, And I think that's like, you know, kind of goes within some of the acceptance, commitment therapy stuff, or even some of the mindfulness stuff of like, let's just sort of remove ourselves and and let it just be this single data point. Yeah, see, see thoughts as thoughts. Yeah. And not have fusion in in with with the thoughts. Um, When I explain the attribution, in therapy to uh, grad students, I'll often give the example of the kid that fails a math test. He fails the math test or he just poorly on the math test. He says, I'm so stupid. I'm never going to be able to do anything. Uh, but if you were to, I, I call it reverse engineering. So it's a technique I write um, internal global stable and I reverse engineer the thought with those, with those three. Right. And so at the end of it, what you hope that they say is, well, Math isn't my strong suit, but I have a really hard teacher this year. If that's true, not making up mm-hmm. anything. I have yeah. a really hard teacher this year and everybody's not doing so well in this class because it's so hard. Um, I, I may, maybe I could have studied more at it um, in the future. If I put more work or if I get tutoring, you know, hopefully I could do better. And I'm only really bad at math or having a hard time with math, but all the other things are doing pretty good at. So it's not that I'm stupid. It's that math is, is is a struggle and a harder class, and I'm pretty pretty okay at everything else. Uh, so that that's how I like reverse engineer from a comment when someone fails and says I'm stupid. Yeah, I love that. Um, and I think this is where also it goes back to some of the growth mindset stuff, where there's this, I think, common misconception that if something is effortful it is a reflection of your inability, right? That like, it's just, you know, you're, you have no business doing this because we have this weird thing in our culture where we, the, the people that we admire and even get entertainment value out of, they make their thing look effortless, right? So then we attribute that as meaning like, it must have always been effortless, right? And really, Um, You know, neuroscience has shown this now that like 
somebody that has more of a growth mindset will actually experience a greater increase in dopamine levels when they're dealing with challenge. And so like it's actually a oh, oh there's a reward mechanism there. And you can actually build that too by just, you know, understanding that phenomenon and then being more willing again to sort of sit longer with that discomfort. Yeah, I, I call it the the sin of instant mastery, where people yeah. think that somehow they're going to be an instant. Like I graduated college, I'm going to be an instant expert, or they go into something at work and it's something new for them, and they think that they're supposed to be an instant expert, and they have no tolerance of mm. their d- developmental level with the thing. Like when you're starting off, you're probably not going to be that good, and that's okay. Yeah, yeah, that's okay because everybody, <laughs> that's where most of us start off, and we of course we have those exceptional people in the top, you know you know, 99th percentile or stuff worth where it might be easy. But for, for most people we, we have, and even those people need to grow. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, instant mastery, the sin of instant mastery is what I call it. And then, oh, yeah. uh, did, did you hit on perception theory? I didn't. So this is, um, uh, this is Robert Neiderfer, uh, who, um, came up with the theory of, uh, attention and interpersonal styles, taste, T-A-I-S. Um, so this is, um, similar to kind of like attribution theory, internal, external, uh, stable, global two by two. Uh, so we get people to think about kind of four modes of attention. So let's take external first. You have external that can be broad attention, and then you can have external that can be narrow attention. And then the same applies for internal. Internal, your attention can be broad and or your attention can be narrow. And then we can kind of put some specific labels into this and also think about these functions when they are working for you as assets versus when they're working against you as liabilities. So external broad uh, can literally be situational awareness, right? And that can be really powerful, beneficial, especially with like TSA. Where that can become a problem is when you get stuck there and then it becomes sensory overload. External narrow is really the state of like actively pursuing something, right? It's, it's the, the, you know, that's like flow that's being present with the task and, you know, just taking that action Mm -hmm. when that's not the case, it's tunnel vision. Right. And 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 you're just sort of overly zooming in on something um, in unable to to move or make a shift in that attention to change the behavior. Internal broad would be. um, uh, Would be analysis. And so then the liability of that is paralysis by analysis. Right. Overthinking a variety of details. Uh, And then internal narrow is um rehearsal mental rehearsal right so you're literally rehearsing one two things most so in sport this could be the sort of internal rehearsal of um kind of in your mind doing some imagery around your uh putting stroke versus rumination right or excessive worry about one thing and so this again gives somebody a, uh, a model for self-awareness to even consider, hey, when I'm under pressure, which one of these quadrants am I more likely to default to? And then from that place of awareness, catching it, noticing it in the moment, and then doing something to interrupt and shift, i.e. regulate to get out of that stuck quadrant to sort of move things forward. So what, what might you do in order to get someone unstuck or shift? Um, so again, you know, the first thing is, is really sort of be becoming familiar enough with the model so that it kind of can sit in the background as sort of a filter. Um, and then it sort of depends like what is, this is where, again, this sort of situation times behavior equals result becomes really important because you want to understand like the right matching. Sometimes the situation does call for being more externally broad in based on that intended outcome. Um, And in this moment, you're not focused on the scene or what's going on around you, but you're actually focused on sort of the 
internal narrow of thinking about what you had for dinner last night or what you're going to have for dinner tonight. Right. And so catching that and then coming up with some way to shift. So you asked how um, this is where I would add in some some breathing, um, you know, breathing obviously can be a great sort of centering tool, but it can be a great interrupter. Right. And so once you notice it, interrupt it with a deliberate breath or two. Um, and then perhaps like literally just label, right. And this comes right out of, you know, the meditation work of like, you know, labeling, okay, I'm right now in a mode of internal narrow, I need to go external broad. Um, and then perhaps having some kind of task focused self-talk that cues you, right. Um, where you're just actually going to sort of tell yourself what you need to be doing, um, in order to kind of take your attention there. Um, and then another theory, um, was hardiness. Yeah. Hardiness, um, goes, um, along with, um, some of the, the diversity of research on mental toughness. So hardiness is a, um, a, a research term um, that is operationalized as including um, one's um, affinity and sort of attention towards control, commitment, and challenge. Um, you know, they've even looked at hardiness as like a personality trait. Um, you know, what are the levels that somebody has in terms of how much they focus on what's in their control? versus what's out of their control. Um, how capable are they of sort of committing, um, persevering? This definitely also ties with Angela Duckworth's work on grit, uh, which is the combination of um, uh, passion and uh, long-term goals. Um, so that passion and perseverance. So how well can you sort of persevere, stay committed with what you are passionate about in the face of challenges? And even being able to see things as more of a challenge um, versus a threat. And, um, you know, there's another theory of, of mental toughness that is sort of the same, but it adds another C, which is confidence. Right. And so we can see where confidence would also uh, obviously be an important piece in here um, and where that active and deliberate self-talk is going to play into someone's level of hardiness. So, you know, it sounds like performance psychology has done a lot of interweaving, taking, taking theories from the years. master interweaver. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think, I think a lot of this, like, like clinical psychology has a lot of interweaving too, and taking principles in order to, to that help us have a theory and explain uh, how, what the mechanism problems are to change it. Uh, but you guys are very much doing the same thing. Yeah. And I, I think, um, I think in this day and age, you're foolish if you're not right. Like if you're any kind of coach, therapist, healthcare practitioner, uh, if in any way you are, you know, leading responsible for others, serving others, like there's so much information out there and we're living in this time of like this global access. Now I think more people need to take leadership in, in helping people understand the context and the overlay um, but you know, there's so much out there that is helping to, um, kind of bring more validity to these different ideas, especially the field of neuroscience. Now, um, you know, psychology focused on behaviorism for so long because we couldn't look inside the mind. Right. But now we actually can, and it actually, in a lot of ways is putting a lot of validity to the kind of art that a lot of psychologists in the you know, early 20th century were coming up with without actually having that access. And I think when we can put those things together, um, it, um, it definitely lends more of that evidence based practice that psychology, um, I think, has always been, you know, wanting to be more rooted in. OK, so if people want to uh, learn more about you, get more information, follow you, um, where can they do that? Uh, so they can do that at equipped, E Q U I P P E D, the number two, 
equippedtoevolve.com. So equipped to evolve is my website. Um, also it's ITS Jared Cohen on Instagram. Um, I, uh, have committed myself, um, as of late to blogging every day. I have uh, surpassed the 30 day mark. Uh, I think last night was, uh, maybe my 34th or 35th blog post in a row. So, wow. uh, a lot of ideas out there that I'm, um, committing to, um, just making a practice of, of, uh, putting out there on a regular basis. So maybe using some of these performance psychology principles on yourself <laughs> to get yeah, you definitely. off going. No, in for writing. sure. Uh, and that's the idea, you know, it's like, even for myself, it, it's been a while, it's taken me a long time to kind of overcome my own mental blocks or barriers for, you know, putting more of my own ideas out there. Um, and, uh, yes, uh, preaching what I practice right now. Okay. Is the key. Um, and then outside of you, any resources, like if people want to learn more about, you know, performance psychology or any of this stuff, what are some external resources that you recommend? And I could put all these in the show notes. Yeah. Um, uh, so many. Um, so some favorites of mine. Um, so one, I would say The Art of Learning by Joshua Waitskin. Um, what else? Um, I want to kind of think of some of the, the essentials here. Um, this is not necessarily directly sport and performance psychology, but I just feel like um, it's so important for everyone, especially this population of mental health uh, professionals to read about and learn more about is Lisa Feldman Barrett's work on emotion. Um, and she just published a new, beautiful, like super um, succinct book called seven and a half lessons on the brain. Um, and she, I think is, is really um, doing some exceptional work of helping us re uh, uh, essentially relearn what we've have gotten wrong about emotion. Um, and, uh, and, you know, there's just so many things like that we've thought about for a long time, just like we once believed with saturated fat, um, that, you know, need a kind of, uh, an update. And I believe that, you know, she's doing a really good job with that. Um, some things uh, that I also find really kind of helpful in terms of mental models, organizational psychology, um, Simon Sinek's latest book, The Infinite Game. Um, if you want a mental model that I think really helps change your perspective and um, improve your motivation towards uh with like a long term perspective is this idea of like finite versus infinite games. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'll stop there. Okay. No, I think, I think that's a very, a very, very good list. And if there's anything later on that you think would be relevant, I could always pop that up in the notes. Cool. Well, thank you so much for taking the time, uh, to come on, on the show. I think a lot of people listening to this are going to be unfamiliar with, with performance psychology. And I think it's a nice perspective, you know, in the clinical side, we realize that we've gotten pretty good at reducing negative affect. Um, but there's a lot of work to be done on increasing positive affect. And, you know, we have that wave of positive psychology and it's cool to see how your, your, your field is working to increase positive, you know, in the performance side. And I would assume that that would also have a emotional shift with it. Like if you're performing better, you're right. probably going to be happier, but I mean, I, it's an assumption at least. Uh, so thanks for coming on and, and telling us, uh, all the great work that you're doing and all the things that you learned in your program. Yeah, Jason, I appreciate it. Like I said, um, this is uh, fun to reconnect. Uh, I think the podcast is great and, and a really great resource uh, for, um, I, I think, anybody in the field of sport and performance psychology uh, to really hear all these different perspectives um, and how ultimately all of us, the end goal is just to help people, right? Yep. And, and I think it's silly when we um, when we cling too much to any one philosophy or idea of this is how I do these things. Um, and when you hear more perspectives, you learn just how it's all very much the same and we're all much more on the same team than we are uh, competitors. Yeah. So thank you for that. Uh, this opportunity to share to the, the archive.